Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to The Money Game, where we use only numbers and facts to make actionable predictions about the big stories shaping the world today. My name is David Wu, the founder of David Wu Unbound, a global forum aiming to promote fact-based debates of our shared future. I don't know about you, but I love making predictions. I think I must have been a fortune teller in another life. There's nothing more gratifying than seeing your predictions come true. Last week, I told you the U.S. was way behind the curve on the third booster shot. Two days later, the CDC announced that they're reducing the time after the full vaccination for the third booster from eight to six months. Last week, I told you Kabul 2021 is likely to be worse than Tehran 1979. Three days later, 13 American servicemen were killed in a suicide bomb attack. It might have been pure luck. I will leave it to you to judge for yourself. The point I want to make is that making good predictions is easier than it looks. We just need a lot of numbers and facts, some historical perspective, and a lot of common sense. You don't have to be right all the time, by the way. If a trader is 51% of the time right, it is enough to make him a rich man. My goal in this program is 52%. By the way, making predictions about markets is more difficult than the real world, but we have time to talk about that another time. Let's now get to the program this week. I wanna talk about two things today, Afghanistan and Powell's speech in Jackson Hole. A lot has been written about Afghanistan. What I want to do today is look at the winners and losers and discuss their reaction functions so that we can better anticipate what is to come, especially beyond the immediate future. I will talk about why I like buying some small cap puts with November expiry to play for unintended consequence of the Afghan crisis. Regarding Powell, I will tell you why his speech in Jackson Hole is full of holes. Either this was a job interview speech or that the most powerful man in the world after the U.S. president is completely behind the curve. I will tell you how best to hedge against the risk that the guy is wrong. But let's start with a short market recap. Cyclically sensitive assets were absolutely on fire this week. Oil, for example, was up more than 10%. Copper. Small cap stocks, emerging market equities all had hell of a week, moving up aggressively across board. The riskiest assets outperform. If you look at the currency world, for example, the best performing major currency last week was the South African Rand, followed by the Brazilian Real. The Turkish Lira is not too far behind. Investors were piling into, if you like, junk. If you remember the previous week, market sentiment had deteriorated dramatically. But guess what? In this week, all that deterioration reversed in some more. It was all about the Fed, of course, and the outlook for U.S. monetary policy. Even before Powell's widely anticipated speech in Jackson Hole on Friday, investors had piling into risky assets based on the expectation of a dovish speech. Powell didn't disappoint. He was even more dovish than the market expected. He was essentially assuring the market that he was not gonna take away the punch bowl anytime soon. With risk-free rates, real risk-free rate at minus 1%, the markets figure, why not junk? Powell basically gave a green light to the fear of missing out herd to keep going. Guess what? Year to date, more than $200 billion have piled into U.S. equity mutual funds and ETFs. This is the highest basically in five years. In fact, even August, as you can see on this chart, has taken nothing away from the enthusiasm of retail investors to keep driving up this market in fear of missing out on the party. You might have heard of the expression, buy on the rumor and sell on the fact. The Fed could not have been any more dovish, but we know that now. U.S. second quarter corporate earnings season couldn't have been any better, and we know that too, because 85% of companies beat expectation. All the good news are out, 
And guess what? We're now heading into September. And September historically has been the worst performing month for the stock market, as you can see on the right-hand side chart. So there is a strong case to be made. Perhaps, perhaps you should consider taking some money off the table, given that probably all the good news, all you're going to get for now. Over the last 20 years, many central banks have become hostages of financial market. This week, one central bank showed that they actually still got some balls. Bank of Korea raised rates. Wow. And this is because they were concerned that financial risk was getting out of control. Over the last few months, there have been growing concerns that young people in Korea are taking out increased amount of debt to do what, you might ask, to buy stocks. Bank of Korea decided that it's time to start the party before it goes any further. Respect. Now let's turn our attention to Afghanistan. I want to talk about the winners and losers of this crisis, but more importantly, I want to talk about the reaction functions of each of the major players, because I believe that understanding the reaction function is crucial if we are to anticipate the repercussions of this crisis, especially beyond the very short term. There's no question the biggest losers are going to be the ordinary Afghans. By the way, Afghanistan's got a population of 40 million, which makes it actually a fairly sizable country. It's in fact more than double the size of Syria. Guess what? 40% of the GDP of Afghanistan comes from international aid, which is definitely drying up if it hasn't already stopped altogether. Moreover, most of the $9 billion foreign reserves of the country are held in the U.S. And the U.S. made it very clear this week that they're not going to release this money to the Taliban. This means there's no question over the next weeks and months, we will see an economic collapse and hyperinflation in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, many hundreds of thousands of Afghans who work for Western nations are going to be hunted down for retributions by the Taliban. Many of the Afghans are going to try to get out. In fact, estimates vary from three to five million Afghans are going to basically seek to get out to go to Europe. The problem, of course, they're going to be facing is the fact that Iran is already beefing up its border control to stop the Afghans by, from getting in. Meanwhile, Turkey has built 150, basically, kilometers of walls on its border with Iran in anticipation of Afghan refugees basically getting in. And moreover, Greece has built a 40 kilometer, basically, walls with its border on Turkey. So from that point of view, this is already a difficult journey under normal circumstances. But for these millions of Afghans who are going to be starving, who is going to be repressed, who are going to try to get out, it's going to be a very tough journey. My heart goes out to them. My heart does not go out, however, to Biden and the Democrats, who are also going to be big losers from this crisis. Biden's approval rating has collapsed, according to the latest USA Today poll. Biden's approval rating now stands at just 41 percent, which is a, the same as Trump's last, basically, uh, days in office. To me, it's interesting that Biden decided this week not to postpone the poll out of U.S. troops. It seems to me by doing so, he is doubling down. He has to be betting that Taliban has just as much incentive for the Americans to leave quickly as he does. So from that point of view, guess what? There's a lot riding on the ability of Taliban to secure the Kabul airport and make sure all foreign nationals are basically able to leave safely. You could argue Biden's basically fate is now very much in the hands of the Taliban. But be that as it may, I think regardless of what happens from here, it's probably going to be extremely difficult for Biden to recover politically from this crisis. In fact, I think there's a very strong case to be made that Biden is going to become a liability for the Democrats in the 2022 elections. For the same reason, I do think with the weakened Biden, 
this is going to make it very, very difficult for the Democrats to actually pass the election reform, which is going to be so critical for their, basically, uh, for their campaign in 2022. Moreover, I would argue even the three and a half trillion dollar fiscal stimulus package that's now on the table, now I think it's going to struggle to get into law. Europe is likely to be a loser as well. As I've been saying for the last two, three weeks, there's no question that the 2015 refugee crisis in Europe was a major contributing factor to the outcome of the Brexit vote. I think the European leadership understands very well they cannot afford another, basically, refugee crisis, especially with Merkel on her way out. And she has done more to save Europe than anybody else. Now, I think, you know, perhaps the border controls between Greece and Turkey, between, you know, Turkey and Iran are going to slow down basically the influx of refugees, but I still think it's reasonable to think that many will probably get through. Now, this probably also just means that Europe, if it doesn't want to take in these refugees, it will have to basically pay for them to stay somewhere else, as it was the case, for example, in the 2015, basically, episode where they had to pay Turkey to basically keep these refugees there. The problem, of course, is that right now, Turkey is having huge domestic problems with the three million plus Syrian refugees already sitting there. I think even with checks from Europe, Erdogan's appetite to taking more refugees this time around is going to be probably far more, far more limited. Shouldn't we consider the Taliban to be the big winner from all this? Perhaps, but perhaps not. Think about it this way. As I said, you know, they're going to be inheriting a country in complete economic ruin. They're going to need a lot of help from the outside. This is the reason why they've been promising to form an inclusive government. But guess what? This week, they placed under house arrest two of the most prominent politicians in the country, the former president, Hamid Karzai, as well as the former chief executive, Abdul Abdullah, two men who could have basically helped them form an inclusive government, the fact that they're under house arrest means that the peaceful transition to power is so much less likely now. What this also means is that, guess what, without the help from the outside, the Taliban will encounter a lot of resistance from many different levels, and this means a civil war is no longer a question of if, but only a question of when. I think China is likely to be a winner from this crisis in Afghanistan. Clearly, you know, the U.S. departure from Afghanistan creates a power vacuum that allows China to get in. But you might say, well, why would China want to get into Afghanistan? Well, there are at least three reasons I can think of. Number one, Afghanistan's got the biggest reserve, okay, of lithium. Now, this lines up very well with China's ambition to become the number one player in the electric car market. Moreover, you know, China could very well decide that they want to expand the China-Pakistan economic corridor to include Afghanistan. Thirdly, guess what? Afghanistan could become a client state, much like North Korea is to China. And guess what? This could give China additional leverage in its dealing with the U.S. Now, that said, I do think it's reasonable to think that Beijing is going to go slow on Afghanistan. For one thing, they want to basically make sure that the Taliban is going to be successful in imposing its rule in Afghanistan. Moreover, Beijing is wary of the strong ties between the Taliban and the Islamic separatists in Xinjiang province. Remember the Uyghurs? This is the reason why I suspect, okay, China is going to allow its ally in the region, Pakistan, to help it navigate the political landscape in Afghanistan after the U.S. departure and hope to wield its influence there using Islamabad. This is why, without question, Pakistan is going to be a big winner out of this crisis. Because you don't know, Pakistan has always been the biggest patron for the Taliban, providing it with money, training, support, safe haven, you know, in the short term, 
Islamabad's relationship with Washington will probably suffer. Already the Americans are blaming Pakistan's for the rapid, you know, basically offensive, you know, by the Taliban that's taken over Afghanistan so quickly. But I think over the medium term, Washington will become ever more dependent on Pakistan if they want to stop al-Qaeda and ISIS from rebuilding their bases in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, of course, I just mentioned before, China is going to need Pakistan to do its dirty work in Afghanistan. All this means is that I think Prime Minister Imran Khan is right now sitting there thinking that both the Americans and the Chinese will have to be much nicer to him going forward. Without doubt, the biggest winners will be the terrorists, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Terrorists thrive in chaos. Remember, the, Sylvi the Syrian civil war gave birth to ISIS. There is no question a civil war in Afghanistan is going to provide a haven for these terrorist groups to rebuild and to recruit. Moreover, the opium business in Afghanistan is going to provide them with a very important source of basically income to keep them going. Of course, ISIS-K and Taliban are sworn enemies. This is the reason why, okay, that these terror groups actually have a pretty strong incentive, okay, to disrupt and to undermine okay, the rule of Taliban in the hope that they may actually continue to thrive in the cracks in a chaotic environment. Most of the important consequences from the Afghan crisis will play out in years as opposed to in days or weeks. This is why it's not that obvious how you might want to monetize on the crisis especially given the fact that I think in the short term, the Taliban does have a strong incentive to actually ensure that Westerners get out safely and quickly. This is also the reason why, even if there were to be additional attacks in the coming days or even Westerners, Americans being held hostage, I think that will necessarily entail the beginning of a new engagement of Western forces in Afghanistan on the ground. I think, you know, if you want to turn a penny on this crisis, I think the best way to think about this is in terms of the impact on U.S. domestic political dynamics. I think with a weakened Biden, it could actually embolden the Republicans to push back more forcefully on the extravagant fiscal agenda of the Democrats. This is why I think it's reasonable to think that after the last two weeks, it's more likely the Republicans are going to dig their heels in and basically, you know, prepare for a showdown with the Democrats over the debt ceiling, which becomes binding sometime in November. And I think that could potentially be quite a scary event because the Republicans might decide that given Biden's collapse approval rating, that the American people are more likely to blame Biden than the Republicans for basically uh, another round of disastrous brinkmanship. For that reason, I actually think the best way to play this is just simply buy a 5% out of money put on small cap stocks that will be potentially most basically vulnerable to such an event. Powell spent most of the time in his speech talking about inflation, why he's not worried about inflation. Let me tell you why I think he is wrong. Powell gave us five reasons why he's not to worry about inflation notwithstanding the spike in U.S. core inflation, as you see on the right-hand side chart. Now, he says, number one, there is no basically signs of a broad-based increase in inflationary pressure. And then he says, while well, in fact, many of the items, especially durable goods like used cars, that have seen basically spike in inflation of late, are starting to see moderating basically price pressure already. Thirdly, he said that he's not seeing actually signs of basically wage pressure building up. Fourthly, he says that long-term inflation expectations remain quite stable and tame. And finally, he says that we should be able to count out, continue basically uh, support from basically these global disinflationary basically uh, forces that have kept inflation in the U.S. at bay over the last 25 years. Powell says there is no signs of broad-based, basically, pressure 
on inflation. But guess what? We look at the Dallas Fed trimming measure of inflation that strips out the outliers like used cars. There's no question that inflation momentum is rising. It's already at 2% and going higher still. Now, you say, well, it's only at 2%, but guess what? Central banks are supposed to be forward-looking. The fact that 2%, despite the unemployment rate still at 5.6%, and we're still in the early inning of this recovery, that should be concerning to the central bank. It tells you that in six months' time, in 12 months' time, inflation could be a lot higher. Powell basically says that we're starting to see signs of moderation of inflation of some of the big ticket items like used cars and computers and so on and so forth. But what he does not mention is the fact that rental inflation, which is by far the most important basically drive of U.S. inflation given the weight of housing in the overall construction of inflation indices, actually most likely is going to be rising from here. As you can see on this slide right here, that housing vacancy rate is actually fairly low right now, which will suggest we're likely to see a pretty robust recovery in rental inflation in the coming months. In fact, if you look at Zillow.com, it tells you that rental inflation is already growing at about 10%. There is no question that this actually latent inflation is going to start to feed into the official inflation numbers going into next year. Powell says he doesn't see any wage pressure, but guess what? The Atlanta Fed, which produces these wage growth trackers, shows that actually wage growth, you know, is averaging more than 4% in the last three months. If you look at this chart, you can see just how stunning that actually looks. In fact, as I said before, even with 7 million people still unemployed from basically uh, the crisis, the reality is that wage pressure is rising as though basically uh, that we're already at full employment in the U.S., and from that point of view, you can see just how different this looks from basically during the previous recovery in 2010, 11, and 12, where wage growth is now double of those levels. There is no question this is a harbinger of high inflation to come. Powell says long-term inflation expectations remains well argued. Well, anchor. He's referring, of course, to the five-year inflation break, even five years forward, that you can extract from, you know, the U.S. yield curve. As you can see on the left-hand side chart, it's true that even though inflation is running at three percent and higher, you know, five-year inflation break, even five years forward, is trading at about, you know, somewhere between two and two and a half percent, which will suggest the market is still quite relaxed. But guess what? I think. Powell doesn't know what he's talking about, because the reality is that when the Fed is engaging in such aggressive QE, the market's ability to price inflation correctly at this point is not just zero, but it's negative. Okay. Whereas if you look at actually the inflation expectation surveys from Michigan and conference board surveys, they're showing you that inflation expectation, at least among U.S. households, has been basically edging ever higher towards the highest level in 10 years. Powell talked about global disinflationary forces, but I think he must be joking because the most important global disinflationary force was globalization. And as we know, globalization has been in reverse basically over the last few years. First of all, as a result of trade war between US and China and elsewhere, and more recently because of COVID, COVID, yes, COVID is now forcing many companies to basically, you know, to onshore, to reduce the dependence on imports. And as you can see on the right-hand side chart, actually the one major price of COVID has been higher freight rates of containers because com countries are become much more hesitant to keep their ports open when there are COVID outbreaks. Powell basically told us that inflation is not too bad right now. Sure, it's not too bad right now, but that is not the point. The point is that central banks are supposed to be forward-looking, and this is because there is a lag between the timing of their policy response and the impact on the economy on inflation. If they wait too long, inflation could get out of control. The, re the fact remains that even though 7 million Americans remain unemployed from the crisis, despite the fact we're still in the initial stage of this recovery, inflation and wages are now growing at a rate consistent with full employment.
and the Fed is now at risk of being behind the curve, and that is dangerous. I was especially disappointed that Powell did not discuss in his speech the most important issue of the day, which is what would be the long-term impact of COVID on the economy, on inflation in particular. As you know, my view is very simple. My view is that COVID represents a negative supply shock, as you can see on this slide here. When you have a negative supply shock, the supply curve shifts to the left, which means that you end up with higher prices, potentially higher inflation. And to the extent I think COVID could very well be here to stay, becoming the new normal, this means we're looking at a permanent negative supply shock that could push inflation permanently higher. I wish Powell could have at least basically taken me on basically in the speech, but he didn't even do so much of that. Now that we know what Powell thinks about the inflation, you know what, next up is going to be the August U.S. job numbers that will be out next Friday. This number is going to be even more important than usual because now we know that the majority of FOMC is considering tapering before the end of this year. If we get another large reading like last month and forget about another million jobs added, let's say even half a million jobs added, I would argue there's a strong case for the Fed to announce tapering already in September. And if that happens, I think the market will have to reprice expectation of short-term rates. Given the market is pricing practically no rate hikes next year, I think, you know, basically Fed funds futures may be just too expensive. I am particularly like selling basically the August 2022 Fed funds future, which costs you literally only three basis points because that's how much the market is priced in basically for the Fed to hike by then. I think from that point of view, this actually make sound like actually an asymmetric bet, if you would like. That's all I've got to say this week. Talk to you next week.